Good afternoon. Today, we're talking to Cecile Vessier, who is the chair of the um, of the Department of Russia at the University of Rennes too, professor of Russian and Slavic and Soviet studies. We will be our workshop today, our seminar today, will be slightly different from our regular ones. Normally, we talk about the books, and here you have a book uh, in my hands, which is called For Our Freedom and Yours, about the Soviet dissident movement. I have two copies, actually, on my table. And the second one is, uh, you would expect the second book to be the book of Cecilia about Larissa Bagaras, but it's actually a book of Joshua Rubinstein, who is present on the call. So we will be talking about stories, plural, stories of Soviet dissidents, written by Western Slavic scholars, Slavis. And my initial question it sounds like this. Can we claim that the research focus um, the, the area of interest of uh, Slavist can be defined and determined by the country where the researcher lives and the cultural background around them and the research tradition of that country. And so I asked Cecile to give us a presentation of sorts, or a lecture that we will follow the common structure of questions and answers, but any any options uh, possible. So I asked Cecile to start talking to us about that, and Cecile sent an introduction. Soviet and Russian dissidents uh, had a great impact on France and its political and cultural life. So Cecile is going to talk not about what I thought she would be talking about, but actually the, the opposite, not how the local context has an impact on your research into a Soviet distance, but the opposite, how the dissidents impact your country. So, but we don't have any limits or, or censorship here. My my request and my inter initial starting point, uh, I already shared with you now, but Cecile will share what is important to her. But please do join a conversation with your questions on both topics, right? Cecile, I think I broke all the rules of moderating. I forgot to say hello. Yeah, but we've been on the on the call for half an hour, so we already said hello to each other. We greet each other perfectly well. And greetings to everyone who's joined the call today. It's very pleasant for me to see all of you today. If you do have questions, please, please do ask them. I would like to start with a joke. There was a com Communist Party of France uh, and its leader who, whenever he attended a TV uh, show, talking show, talk show, and um, whenever he was asked a question, he was always responding to different questions. So when when you said um, earlier today that you, whenever you have your questions, I have my answers. This is somewhere where we are right now. But still, because I'm not Georges Marché from, uh, from France, I will do answer your questions. Of course, we are the products of our cultures. In a way, we will live and, and work in certain contexts. There is a well-known psychologist in France who's... Sorry to interrupt you, still at the very moment. Yes, let's remember about the interpreters and, and speak slower. We have, we have, because this continues, we have a psychoanalyst in France who said once that any scientific topic it's a it's a personal topic it's a personal area of interest it's something the scholar uh, the researcher is interested in themselves so we don't make ac accidental choice of topics and themes it's always related to the history of our family history of our country and we what we write we are always trying to be objective, but nevertheless, we're, we remain in the context of our culture and our story, history. 
and the very fact that when when I decided to start writing that book, with, you you see it here uh, in its French version, and we already shared why we already discussed why the the title differs in Russian and, and French, but I, it's an interesting uh, question. But that was 1993 when I started writing the book. That's when I started writing my doctoral thesis. 1993 was the year, was the time when it seemed that the Soviet Union is over with. And it seemed that Russia, precisely Russia, I'm talking about Russian dissidents, not Soviet dissidents, Russian dissidents, one who lived in Russia, who wrote in Russian. It's important because there were Ukrainian dissidents who who were different, who had other other claims made and other demands uh, and other in, uh, inventory of tools. I'm writing precisely about the Russian dissidents. And it seemed in 1993 that Russia it has set um, uh, its path towards uh, being a more and more democratic country. And for at least five years, since 1988, we had been talking uh, more or less openly uh, russia had been talking more or less openly about what dissidents had wrote earlier in some is that in uh, immigration so that was the time when when we in france we watched all of this and and we lived through this processes from our own side and we're focusing on how how these people, this society, this country will go out of its, as you say now, complicated past from the out of the totalitarian regime, regime, authoritarian regime, and so on. Why in France this was a very important question for us. You asked the question about the country. There is also always a question of personal biography one's own life story yeah. in the book that you showed uh, us i explained that dissidents wanted they never wanted to kill and uh, hang all the communists but they wanted to defend the uh, the rights of people they wanted to defend those people who advocated for the rights and without even thinking about it, they they deconstructed all the myths that the communist authorities or the Soviet regime had been building throughout the history of the Soviet Union within the country and outside of it. Meaning that in France, and, and and in a different de definitely it was di it looked differently in Poland and I think in, in Germany as well but maybe in Italy it's reminded us more or less of can remind us more or less of what happened in France in France quite a few people believed that in the Soviet Union starting with the 1920s and 30s a new country a just regime is being built where everyone will be happy to live. After the war, immediately after the war, on the, uh, during the elections that were organized in France, after all the falsifications uh, of history and uh, the resistance and the war history and the, the history of the uh, agreement between the Soviet U Union and the uh, German regime, Still, the German, uh, sorry, the Communist Party of the Communist Party of France became its leading party for several years. So yes, people really, truly believed that. I, I'm I'm now reading several brochures who, that were published in in 1947-48. All of those texts were by those communists were stating that the Soviet Union is not interested in another war the soviet union is protecting the world and uh, uh, striving for peace and that in five years 
people would be living in Soviet Union much better than we are living now in the West. So there was this passion of those communists, not all communists shared it, but that was quite visible in France. And the dissidents, the people who, who did not agree, there were the immigrants and the dissidents, um, slowly started deconstructing and debunking those myths about Soviet Union. So when when on the podcast we we discussed your question, why uh, when you talk about the struggle of dissidents in France or the struggles struggle on the fight of dissidents, because for us here, and that's an answer, my answer to your question, what we had was an impression that there is a struggle of dissidents, a struggle for truth. Who was lying? The question was, who was lying? It's the communist who said that the paradise is being built in Soviet Union, or were the dissidents lying, or the migrants, uh, immigrants who were telling us that the Soviet Union is killing and murdering people and persecuting for uh, dissent, and people are dying out of, of hunger and so on. And so, when you in France decide to write about the dissidents and about the dissident movement in Russia, precisely at the point when it seems that this is over and uh, we are getting closer to normality, to normal political processes and, and intellectual debates, you, of course, are writing this as a person who, who was brought up in the culture where that intellectual uh, intellectual debates had a huge space. And I had communist teachers of history in my times who presented the history of the Soviet Union as um, as a, in, in a certain way and from a certain perspective. But there were also others who claimed the opposite. So I me being the outcome and the product of my culture, I was for, I, I, I had my own angle. Besides that, I want to say one thing. I am aware that it would it would be much more comfortable to write. It is much more comfortable to and easier to write about a different culture. There are things you don't you don't understand how those people you don't understand it the same way how those who grew up in that culture in Russian Soviet Union. At the same time. And I have observed this because I, uh, I've also written about the French resistance during the war, Second World War. So when you write about your own culture, you are always a little bit afraid to offend someone. You're always afraid that someone will get hurt. Because if you write that this person betrayed his their their comrades, their friends, allies, that's you know, someone might get offended. But but when you write, and I and I know that this might have been difficult for dissidents who uh, shared what they have experienced themselves. When you you asked me a question about the Alexeva, Alexeva when she she wrote about what she had seen with her own eyes and what she had lived through. Uh, this is this is a very valuable testimony. But on the other hand, she, it was very difficult for her because she was writing about her friends, people whom she knew. While I was writing from afar, I I made my research. I I'm, I try to understand things, but. But I come from a different culture in different country, and it's a culture where politics and relations toward uh, attitude towards communism and towards those myths are different. So I hope I answered your question. May I ask you a question about how the attitude towards the Russian immigrants was formed through those dissenting? How was it formed in France? Because I'm interested in all those stages, what happened before the 60s, 
what happened in the 60s, for example, was the one day of Ivan Denisovich uh, in the life of in the, if, uh, in the life of Ivan Denisovich was it uh, noticed? Be did Solzhenitsyn become that prominent figure already in the 60s, or only when uh, uh, the Gulag Archipelago was published? Because 1974 is the border kind of it's the it's the moment when many people immigrated to france out of the soviet union and that's when the continent was um established can we talk about that period how society at that moment we cannot say that a lot of people emigrated during that period it was like a third wave. Now is the fifth wave. We keep talking about these waves of Russian and Soviet emigrants. In the 70s, there were very noticeable personalities that emigrated. The thing is, it's quite important that, yes, we did have that passion for communism. Many people truly wanted to believe that communists were trying to build a better world. And yet we also had many emigrants from Russia. And those emigrants from Russia, at the very beginning, these were those emigrants who left straight after the revolution, so the white emigrants, so to speak. There were quite a few of them. Sometimes they would come via Turkey, sometimes via the Balkans or through Berlin. There were a number of them in Berlin, in Prague as well, such people such as Tsvetaeva. A lot of them decided to reside in France. And what's interesting, was a presentation I attended recently of a book, a book by Leonid Litvak. He had lived for a year in France, in Paris, and he started writing and published a book about how those white emigrants were received after the revolution. I attended that presentation and in the bookshop that was created by those immigrants. He talked about how these immigrants were received much better than is normally, than we normally perceive, than we normally hear about. In the sense that people had heard about why they had left and what was going on in Russia. And in the context of the struggle for human rights, there were communists who said that the white immigrants were reactionaries that were leading the people astray. There were also people who said that the Soviets are the ones who are killing people in the Soviet in Soviet Russia, that they are destroying the culture and that these white immigrants are ready to return to their country as soon as the Soviet government is eliminated. So immigrants came to France and they would say very interesting things. And whether people heard of them or not, they did exist. Another thing was before the war, there were people who arrived in France who, was very, who were very close to the commun communists in France. He was friends with Lenin. This is important because he's pretty much one of the creators of the Bolshevik Party and the Communist Party of France. At a certain point, he realizes that it's not the path that he wants to take. After that, Followers of Trotsky came over. Trotsky resided in France for a while. But 
And his followers would also say that we are also communists, but the communism that is being constructed in the Soviet Union is not what we want. This is important because in reality, in actuality, there were a lot of publications about things that were happening. And when we talk about information about persecutions in the Soviet Union, we already had that information in the 30s. In the 30s, in 1937, we already knew about the terror that happened in the Soviet Union. There are books, there are publications. And when we reread them now, we realize that this was already said back at that point. And this is a curious point to compare the things that are happening in Russia today. There is information, it is available, about the crimes and persecutions that are taking place. But the availability of this information does not mean that this influences people's actions. This does not mean that this affects the way people think doesn't mean it affects their attitudes towards communism back then and um, their attitudes towards the war in Ukraine. If we look at the present day, most Russians know what is going on, but for various reasons, they do not change their attitudes. These reasons today are different from those that existed back, uh, back then in France, but it's important to take into account when we have this discussion. because it takes time for people to take action. It doesn't happen overnight. Then came the war. Towards the end of the war and after the war came the second wave of emigrants. Few of those people stayed in France. There were many Ukrainians in that wave, a lot of Belarusians. And part of the Ukrainian immigrants in France are actually descendants of those who were sent by the Germans to Germany to work there. And they decided to stay there uh, in Germany. That was their first post, so to speak, in those camps. And I don't mean um, concentration camps, I mean refugee camps. Many of them stayed in Germany, part of them moved to France, and some moved to Canada. The reason this is important to mention is that these people were very different from the first wave of immigrants not only in terms of their nationality, but also because of their class, so to speak. They were working class people. But when the, this biggest court case about the communists took place in 1949 between Kratchenko and the Communist Journal, they came to give testimony. They came to testify about how it really was in the Soviet Union, in the 20s, in the 30s, when the country was sort of cut off from the rest of the world. They gave this testimony, and that's why an important stage was this process between Kravchenka and the communist journal, Les Lettres Françaises. You probably are aware of these process, in a few words, in a nutshell, Kravchenko was a 
Soviet official who was sent to America during the war in 1943 in order to obtain weapons and equipment. And he stayed in America. In America, he wrote a book, I Choose Freedom where he tells the story of how he used to be a communist, he used to be in the Komsomol, he was from a revolutionary family and believed in all of this ideology. And then he says, oh, but then I saw with my own eyes how collectivization happened. He lived in the Ukraine. He said, I saw how people are starving. I saw how people die of hunger. And I later became the director of a factory, and I saw how the director of NKVD organized the work of these prisoners and how they worked, who were scientists, and they worked in factories. And I saw these concentration camps. This is 1947 when this book was published, and that's when this talk of camps started circulating. This was right after uh, France had discovered the German concentration camps. And all of a sudden, they are told this was not only a struggle against the whites or those who wanted the Soviet government. And there were people who started talking about these terrible camps that were operating in the Soviet Union. Our Communist Party, with their journals and newspapers, started writing about how Kravchenko was not the author of the book. And this is a very common theme with dissidents. They kept saying that he was the enemy, not only of the Soviet Union, but also of humanity and that he is wrong, that he lives life in a wrong way. And in 1949 was that um, trial. It was in February or March. And all of these displaced people, those workers, the Kolhoz workers from the Soviet Union, they, come, they came from their refugee camps that they had been in for four or five years. And it, very simply, they say, yes, we have seen this too. And on the other hand, there are all of these communist intellectuals from who work in newspapers, the journalists, the editors. They had never been in the Soviet Union or Russia they did not speak Russian. And they said, these people are liars. They don't know what the Soviet Union is. So there was this struggle. And if you haven't read this yet, I highly recommend reading the book by Nina Birberova. She was an, an immigrant of the first wave of immigrants. And she was at all of these trials. And she was horrified. She said, to hear with my own ears how a professor of Sorbonne said that what we are saying cannot be true, that these camps in the Soviet Union are a lie. It's not real. This was so shocking to me. There are several books. You can read the transcripts of these trials, but you can start with Nina Berberova's book. And even all of our leftist intellectuals had to accept this, to accept the fact that these camps did exist in the Soviet Union. And then one of my favorite questions is asked, okay, so you know that constant, these camps existed. So in the 30s, if you wanted to find out about these persecutions in the Soviet Union in the 30s, you could do that. And then the question arises, does that mean that I can't support that government anymore? 
And in the 50s, SATA released a report about forced labor in the Soviet Union. He writes in his journal, yes, there are camps. There are prisoners, political prisoners in the Soviet Union. There were tens of millions of political prisoners and prisoners. Uh, now we know that that's not true. There was a maximum of two million. That was in 1952. But it was at that point that he became closer to the Soviet government, to Soviet writers, and agreed to go to the Soviet Union. So the fact that there are political prisoners, that there are camps in the Soviet Union, back then was not reason for criticizing the Soviet Union or to saying that you want nothing to do with that government. And at the beginning of the 50s, Sat um, visited the Soviet Union in 1954 for the first time, so after the death of Stalin. So there was the death of Stalin and then the report at the 20th Congress. And everyone in France knew about that report. And our beloved Communist Party, up until the end of the 80s, kept saying, that this is a report that Khrushchev uh, allegedly read. We don't know for sure. This may be a fake, of course. And the Communist Party of France never acknowledged, accepted the uh, report. So Khrushchev, then the Otsipil time, and then and we expected everything to become better in the 90s and uh, democracy to arrive. And we expected the situation to be, sorry, not in, that, it's in the later Soviet times. And then it comes the one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. You will probably ask me why this book became um, um, a phenomenon because it was a short book that answered uh, many questions that had been asked in France for a year, for years. Who, who was, who published it and uh, were there any discussions around it? Yes, there were discussions. And, and that book, uh, unlike Archipelago, was published in the Soviet Union officially in Novemir in the November of 62 as we know. So the Soviet Union exported this book, which there was a kind of a very was quiet conflict around it because there were two translations and two publishing houses. Uh, so the book came to France through two different channels, but it did come with authorization of the Soviet Communist Party and with the with an agreement of the Communist Party of France. So even the communists read it. And it was a sign of, look, the Soviet Union is changing. It started st started telling the truth of what had, what had been happening during Stalin's times. Even when I speak of communist influence in France, it's not just the impact of the Communist Party, it was the impact of the main uh, intellectuals, Aragon, whom I suppose, suppose no one knows in Russian. Uh, 
who was a wonderful poet, who wrote wonderful, amazing poems and good novels. I don't like them too much, but they are decent novels. And his wife, Elsa Triolet, who was a sister of Lila Brick, and Lila Brick, whom you whom you definitely remember, was a great love of uh, Mayakovsky. Her first husband, Osip Brick, worked uh, probably in in the in the Chika, in the in the uh, security services, and Lila Brick probably. She also so it was involved, so there was, so we can trace uh, the trains, the uh, influence of those organs on Aragon, who was passionate communist. But as a triolet, she knew everything. She, she she became a writer in France and decent one as well. She knew everything that had been happening in Soviet Union. She was aware that the third husband. Or second or third husband of her her sister Lila was a Soviet army general, and he was arrested during the purges of the Red Army, and he was sentenced and shot uh, through the, during those purges. She she knew that, and she was aware of the purges. Mr. Rubenstein, who is here tonight, we 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 discussed Edinburgh. Uh, topic Edinburgh who lived half of the half of his life in France he also was aware that Soviet citizens are being arrested he he, he had a decent French he was interviewed so both uh, Elsa Triolet and Edinburgh, to a certain degree, when when the Khrushchev's report became public and when the thaw became, so they started started opening up and talk, and saying more. And to their friends, they started share, with their friends. They started sharing on what is, what had been happening. This one was sentenced. This one was shot and executed. So people who are Soviet people who who were the channels of information for between our countries they started opening up and sharing of uh, the concrete examples and stories that were they were aware of and so the book the book of Solzhenitsyn that was published with an official approval of the party one of the versions was translated by Kapala. That's that's the last name of the translator, who then who st was still a passion communist living in the Soviet Union. And then then this sparked a debate whether uh, um, um, around the fact of the existence of the concentration camps as you remember in Solzhenitsyn's books uh, book there are many stories and um, different cases of this one was arrested for this that one was arrested because his parents were thought to be kulaks uh, or this person was arrested because he had been uh, he'd been imprisoned as a prisoner of war during the war for two days and when he was released then the Soviet comrades considered him to be to be a um, traitor. So, there were intellectuals mentioned who were persecuted and so on. So, I understand that this is not Shalamov and this is not Archipelago, but nevertheless, the French who were who had been debating for a long time uh, around the camps and discussing them, they finally realized that yes, this this is true. The camp, the camps are closed. There no more, and uh, and that's why Khrushchev allowed to publish because this problem is solved. It doesn't exist anymore, and that's when, uh, and then four years later, the 
than the courts uh, and cases against the intellectuals started. So the case of Sinyavsky and Daniel, and the French were observing that, like we are now observing the arrest of, of uh, Russian uh, two young women who are um, a director and a screen uh, and a playwright we well, like we are observing this now we are so we, so we're, we're observing Sinyavsky and, and Daniel's case so that for people being arrested and persecuted for publishing texts and that they that they had to be given five or seven years of prison or camps for uh, for publishing a text so the French people based in their culture, we're realizing that this is a persecution. This is a violation of freedom of, of speech. This is a persecution of intellectuals. And we know that the intellectuals in France are, as a move, as a, as a phenomenon in, in the late of 19th century, um, they, they they were formed by by uh, taking the side of Dreyfus in the in those two two important court cases. So our French intellectuals were very painfully re re reacting, not to the persecutions of kolhoz and and peasants and and workers, but to the persecution of intellectuals. Cecile, you you mentioned Zolia. The the in the 1966 was that still a fresh memory of Zolia's example. Was it still remembered? Was it discussed or remembered this experience of Emile Zola, who stood for Dreyfus? Yes, yes. And we still remember, actually. It's an important uh, moment in French history because because it's, an, it's the foundation of the identity of the French intellectuals. And that this is something that uh, we, we can speak about later, but the, the Jewish question in, in the French history is also important. So when when the uh, presentation, the report of Khrushchev happened, as I recently um, I, as I recently read in 1955, the French Jews were writing to Le Monde and they were writing such things as Sartre has just visited the Soviet Union. Edinburgh came back to us, to France. We have to ask them questions about those Soviet Jewish writers about whom we heard during the war, meaning those who were actually persecuted and uh, executed in 1952 as part of the KF, the, uh, the uh, case of anti uh, the Jewish anti fascist com uh, committee uh, case as part of the case they were executed. So, and the French, French people, French uh, Jewish people were. Um, heard about those Jews from the Jewish anti-fascist committee from the Soviet Union. And so, and now they're asking Le Monde, where are those Jews from this anti-fascist committee? Why don't we hear their voices? Where are they now? Which means that this was, uh, there was a connection of sorts that in French were interested. And, but not just as, as Jews, but as French intellectuals who were really were really aware and self-aware uh, so started self-identifying as French intellectuals after the case of Dre Dreyfus here in court and um, and Zola stand, standing for Dreyfus. So the question is what's happening to Soviet Jews and the repressions that was part of their uh, that they were interested in that. And they, they now see that the people are being persecuted for their freedom of speech. Um, the Sinyavsky and Daniel, and one of them is a Jew. So, and one who was who chose a Jewish pseudonym. So for, for us in France, that was also an important factor. And this is 1966. So 20 years after the war, 
in France. That is, that means that still in France, by then, there was not enough of discussion of how during the war the Jews were arrested by uh, arrested by the Germans in France with the help of the French. So, and that was a big, big issue. And suddenly, people people see that in the Soviet Union, all those issues are all tied in and connected. And that that's the moment when the intellectuals became active. Until then, they had been a uh, they would have been concerned, interested, watching, observing. But when uh, the Brodsky uh, court happened, Seth wrote a letter, but that was not an open letter. But when it was the case of Daniel and Sinyarsky, they were on went on trial. That's the moment when the French intellectuals activified themselves. They were mostly of left views um but they started writing letters to trying to protect the writers and their colleagues and that's the moment there's something that starts something we will discuss later today it's so this is kind of a feeling of of professional solidarity so you protect your own the writers protect the writers. You'll see later mathematicians are protecting the mathematicians. The physicists are protecting the physicists and, and standing for the physicists. And that's, that's quite a beautiful image. Mm, I, what I mean is the nationality, the citizenship, it's not the strongest identity. What is the most, this, the, the strongest identity is that we are a community of a fellowship of writers, of intellectuals, mathematicians whatever the country of our residents, despite the borders and the differences and the different citizenship we might hold. So that's that's uh, when it happened. So all those trials and all the publications which started appearing in France immediately, what kind of publications? Well, for example, if when Alexander Ginsburg created his white book, about the trial of Sinyavsky and Daniel, and that white book, which you remember, might remember, this is just documents. It's just the protocol and the transcript of what had been said at the, at the trial, plus that's the letters of those who wrote in Soviet Union to, to try to defend and, and uh, protect those two writers. And those were the articles that were that had been published. So there, there was no analysis, and that was on purpose actually, because we we are just providing you with mere facts. With that white book was immediately translated and published in France, and then there was a trial of Ginsburg. And uh, and people already heard his name because of this book, white book that he put, that he published. So yes, we know him. We read his white book. So this this chain of events of persecution and of persecution and arrests and trials became alive for people, and people in France started following the events through the text of the dissidents. Even now, I must say that. Especially in the beginning, there were there were some issues with promise to understand this, what was happening, because we had the emigration descendants who kept telling us, "We used to, we told you all the time, nothing is good can, nothing good can come out of the Soviet Union." There were people also of the right or ultra right views who used to be connected connected to NTS that was kind of based in Germany but not those who who, who not who lived in France and uh, became the translators of those texts so when we say ultra right and uh, so and uh, 
we were told that Sinyasi, Daniel, and Gisberg were anti-communist, even though we know that the dissidents initially not necessarily had to be anti-communist because that was an evolution of sorts and they were fighting, they were not fighting communists initially, but but our ultra-right uh, speakers here started saying that, that oh, they finally realized communism is, is bad. There were also Trotskyists who still existed in France, and they said, oh, it's wonderful, these uh, dissidents, they are, they are Trotskyists, in fact. They are holding the same positions as we do. And when I wrote, when I wrote a book about Larissa Bogaraz, I showed her, I showed her the book, I showed her the book published uh, by Trotskyists in France, where it was said that Yuri Daniel is a real Trotskyist. And I remember Larissa laughing her lungs out because we never would have thought in Russia, in Soviet Union of night of. Oh, 56 or 66 that um the, that there that any trotskists left alive in the world we barely remember the last names so and um probably that's a common thing for so for people in such situations they said oh these people are represent of our view represent our views they fight against communism or the trotskists or their intellectuals or jews so people took them for their own but it all uh, it just proves that there was a strong interest. Cecilia, thank you so much. Uh, it's so interesting what you're sharing. I'm afraid that we might we might not even go to the 70s. So you ask about the context. So here you see the context, right? So the end of the 60s, late 60s, early 70s. Okay, okay. I'll 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 try to be fast and succinct. So all of these trials and all those texts that appeared and immediately after that the persecution against uh, Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn, of whom everyone in France had heard by then, because all French intellectuals have uh, have heard of him, and he's excluded from the writers' uh, union. And that's a persecution of a writer for them. Then the Nobel, Pri Nobel Prize. And three years later, suddenly it's the, 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 the archipelago comes out. And for us, the archipelago was published for the first time in, 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 in the end of 1973 in Russian, with the help of the immigrants' descendants and the Slavists who, who helped us translate it. This became a revolution. It, an explanation why Communist Party in France can get no more than 3% of the votes. It's because of the Kipilago. Because the first volume was published in 600,000 copies, which is an enormous amount for France. 600,000 over six months. So the huge debates and discussions around the book, what were they we were discussing? It, can you still be of left views and, and, and not support the Soviet Union and the regimes, the authoritarian type of regimes? We're having those debates again now because because our left people used to support Putin as well. And now the question is again, can you can you be of left views and not support such regimes? So huge debates and discussions. and discussions of, of personal views of social needs in, but it still happened. Um, so in our case, the Communist Party could never get as many uh, supporters as, as it used to because of archipelago. It could never adapt. In Italy, they managed to rethink themselves, this Euro-communist in France, this, uh, this, uh, 
the Stalinist type of and the things we hear now in the context of Putinism and the communist people said all oh, the communism is wonderful all these ideas but in in france it will look different all those all those russians they they um perverted it all and our communist historians wrote that the russians russians by nature do not like freedom they don't require freedom and uh, well like now you can hear that yes uh, it's bad in russia these days but it's because people in russia don't want freedom you see it's, it's an interesting point and that's why i like to return to historical processes yes because you understand that a communist uh party in france would never gain so much support as it used to and yet the ideas of how all these russians i have these wonderful books um about how russians don't like freedom they don't want freedom they don't want to fight for their rights all of these ideas have remained and this is a sort of next step uh, to realize that things are a bit more complex than that in any case after this book was published the um, communists absolutely hated Solzhenitsyn yet most Frenchmen realized that in the Soviet Union the society that they would like to live in was not being built different processes start taking root and on the one hand the communist intellectuals leave the party part of them left uh, after budapest in 1956 Part of them left after Czechoslovakia, after the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union. A great number of them left the party after Solzhenitsyn. And it feels like it was not, it was no longer the done thing to stay in the Communist Party after Solzhenitsyn. It was just not right. And what does take place is, for instance, the communists start looking for those who they call the anti-Solzhenitsyn. Who is the anti-Solzhenitsyn? There were two situations, two people that they found. First, it was Eduard Kuznetsov. Eduard Kuznetsov, as you may remember, uh, who was uh, prominent in the case of the uh, um, aircraft builders. They wanted to leave the, these were Jews. Oh yeah, these were the Jews who wanted to leave using a plane from the Soviet Union and they were caught. He was imprisoned and yet he published a book about this process, about the struggle of the Jews for their right to leave the country. And at that time, many intellectuals started defending the Jews who wanted to leave the Soviet Union. More than that, they started defending, and that's wonderful, this should have been done, uh, they started defending Leonid Blush. You may remember this was a big name for us, a big case. He's a mathematician, a Ukrainian mathematician, who was well connected both with Russian human rights defenders and Ukrainian dissidents, those who wanted Ukraine's independence. 
he claimed to have Marxist views. And that's why our communists would say, the French communists would say, there's a dissident who was put in a psychiatric ward despite his Marxist views. He is our person. He's not like Solzhenitsyn. And there were all of these campaigns of the human rights defenders, of mathematicians, of the intellectuals. And um, there were March, there were uh, George Marchais from the Communist Party who appealed to Brezhnev to release Leonid Blush. Thankfully, Leonid Blush was released from the psychiatric ward. He came to France. He was feeling very bad because he was given um, he was given treatment, so to call, uh, so to speak, treatment at the psychiatric ward. Our communists were absolutely shocked about what Solzhenitsyn was saying about the Soviet Union, but about six months after Blush got better, he stopped saying that he was a Marxist and he condemned the French communists for not talking about the persecutions in the Soviet Union enough. So it was a rather funny situation, although it is tragic. When I say it's funny, I mean that when we talk about how our views diverge, when we look at history through the eyes of a French historian or, or a um, Soviet eyewitness, of course, our French people could not understand how this person that we defended, that we protected because he said he was a communist, how could he come to us and condemn the communists? But of course, life is a lot more complex and complicated than that. To see these ideas of these different people. But in the 1970s, when all of the Helsinki group was um, put together in the Soviet Union, when this movement of solidarity was being developed in France and other countries, there were people who were imprisoned in the Soviet Union for defending their rights. And that's why these organizations got together. They were usually based around um, certain professions. So if a mathematician was uh, arrested, like Yuri Arlov, for instance, and a Sakharov, although he was not immediately imprisoned, Sharansky was imprisoned. So that's when the mathematicians got together. That's when the physicists got together in order to protect their own people, just like writers used to protect each other. This happened not only in France, but a psychiatrist would also get together into groups So we have written evidence that uh, there are people who are imprisoned and put into psychiatric wards for their dissidents, and we are ready to provide uh, to um, conduct expert expert um, investigations into these cases. There were lawyers in France who said, we are ready to be defendants at these trials. Of course, they were not allowed to enter the Soviet Union. However, some of them were able to meet with the families of those dissidents. They would travel to the Soviet Union as tourists, 
and meet these families, of course, they were not allowed to officially be defendants and uh, lawyers at these court cases, at these trials. What I'm driving at is dissidents were able to change the political situation in France. Because in a way, with in a non-violent way, they dispelled myths of the Soviet happiness and prosperity. They were able, through their actions, to create a movement of support. And this indeed changed quite a bit. Cecile, this is very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting, but not democratic because we are not giving the floor to the uh, to the speed to the listeners. Uh, are there any questions or any comments from the audience? Because you have already said many things, many new things. Is there anyone who would like to comment or ask? Yes, there were protests, Cecile says. Oh, yes, uh, maybe uh, maybe you have some protests or maybe you have some differing opinions. Thank you very much, I see in the chat. I thank you as well. But what we need is questions. What is something that still needs to be clarified? Something you'd like to know more about? May I ask a question? Thank you so much. This is Tatiana Levin speaking. I'd like to ask a question that I had at the beginning about SARTA. Is there any information about a SARTA's visit to the USSR? perhaps some publications in French or other languages, is there something you can recommend? Yes, I can indeed, says Cecile. Do you read French? That's wonderful. In a few months, I am going to publish a book about Sartre in the USSR. It is going to be about how he was received, how he was used for propaganda purposes in the USSR, also, there is a book in Russian. Olga, you might remember the first readings um, dedicated to Draginsky. There was a book published, it's orange. And uh, it features an article that I had written in Russian. I believe that Nina Veler has uh, has taken this book from me. I think she has it right now. Uh, yeah, I am coming back, says Cecile. I hope you can see me. This book was published by Memorial, who used to be able to exist legally in Russia. So the dissidents of the USSR and their legacy. This article contains the, the naked facts about how many times Sartre visited the Soviet Union. He visited the USSR between 1954 and 1961. He visited 11 times. This is quite interesting because he visited Russia and Ukraine and Georgia, and he met many writers. He did not see many things, he doesn't remember a lot, but he fell in love with a woman, truly fell in love. 
And I may be relating this too simplistically, but when he realized that the Soviet Union was not the embodiment of the revolution and the revolutionary movement that he had been dreaming about. He started just as uh, many of our leftist intellectuals becoming interested in China. So I am planning to release this book in about November in French, so you're very welcome to read that. Any other questions, protests? There is one. Someone has raised their hand. Ekaterina Vasilieva has raised her hand. Thank you very much. I would like to clarify about what you have uh, called the search for anti Solzhenitsyn. This, as far as I understand, was not an attempt to justify the Soviet regime, but uh, an attempt to find a more kind of like progressive criticism of the Soviet Union than Solzhenitsyn, something that would include, let's say, the Jewish perspective. As far as I understand, the Communist Party in France was trying to integrate this criticism into their policies, into their ideology, and was this successful? As far as I hear from what you're saying, the Communist Party has not regained its popularity. So do you think it's because they did not succeed in that quest? That is indeed important. There were books written on this subject. They did indeed find and use this term, anti-Solzhenitsyn. Many communists started defending the Jews who were trying to leave the Soviet Union. They were able to criticize one aspect of the Soviet government. The um, Soviet government was not allowing people to emigrate. This is not a criticism of the regime, of the ideology, but just of one aspect. And they started looking for Marxist dissidents to say, see, in the Soviet Union, it's not quite the way we uh, imagined, but it's not a problem of the, of communism itself, but it's a problem of the Russians who don't understand anything about freedom. On the one hand, the fact that uh, the communist leaders of France could not ignore the fact that there are persecutions in France, and this bothers a lot of French people for various reasons. On the one hand, they had to do something about it, but they were not able to go through with this. And as a result, in 1991, when the Soviet Union dissolved, the French Communist Party was pretty much the only Communist Party in Europe who said that uh, the the outcomes of the communist rule of Russia were positive. And everyone else was looking at them and saying, what positives are you talking about? Because we saw not only the persecutions, but also the low standard of living in, in the Soviet Union as compared to, let's say, France. The Communist Party of France was not able to criticize what was happening in the Soviet Union. They kept saying that, you know, it's not communism itself, it's just the way it was uh, realized in the Soviet Union. The Italians did more in this respect. Their Communist Party 
remains strong. But in France, that's not the case. So it was quite funny back then, and being a communist is not prestigious at all. There are, of course, some movements that say that we need to come back to Marx, the teaching of Marx, but the French Communist Party kind of failed itself by supporting the Soviet Union and by supporting the Soviet government. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Any other statements? I hope you are not sleeping. Judging by your faces, you are not. The faces that we see are wonderful, uh, but we cannot see many of the of the other faces. I see that Joshua is Rubenstein is raising his hand. I have one comment. The atmosphere around all of these issues has changed in the 70s because of organizations such as Amnesty International. And if it's important to uh, protect prisoners of conscience in South America and Africa, we must protect these prisoners of consciousness in uh, Eastern Europe, in the Soviet Union. It has become important to compare the situation in one part of the world with the situation in another part of the world. People have started to realize that it is possible to compare the repressions that took place in different countries. And it is possible to offer support and protection to all of those. And I think this has changed the discourse and policies in Europe, in Africa, in South Africa, in South America, in the United States. Thank you very much. I agree. I believe that in France, on the one hand, it was a very a principal issue. We were ready to protect those who are dissidents, even in America, but and we also know that there are political prisoners everywhere. Uh, what's interesting in France is that this is the work of both intellectuals and the workers' unions. And when our workers' unions started defending people in the Soviet Union, because they were persecuted, this was especially important because it became a common, um, common work. And these political prisoners became those people that were protected both by the French workers' unions, and I think that's even more important than Amnesty International in France. And I'd like to add one thing, if I may. We will keep talking about how the situation changed in the Soviet Union and in Russia after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now in France, I am noticing an interest, a growing interest towards these issues. For instance, we recently published a book on Samizdat, and it was the first book 
uh, in France about this. Another wonderful book was published in France. I received it just yesterday. Um, a book about Polish culture, or rather uh, the Polish journal titled Kultura Culture, a journal that was highly influential among dissidents, among dissidents, emigrants from Eastern Europe, from Russia, in France. The situation in Russia, for various reasons, reminds us of what was happening back then, even though now we might argue that this is even worse. Just two days ago, I was at um, a forum of the opposition in Paris. And Russian lawyers uh, kept saying that France must insist that Russia releases its political prisoners. So at the same time, I can't say that there is um, a big movement in France for releasing the new political prisoners of Russia. And I think that we have to draw on the experience of on previous experience so that we can give rise to a movement of this kind. Because what the Russian authorities and government is doing in Ukraine now is even worse than what was happening in the 70s in the Soviet Union. That experience is not just some kind of academic, um, an academic thinking exercise. It's not just about research. I believe it is something that helps us understand what is going on today in Russia, with Russia, in Ukraine. And it is something that helps us move forward, drawing on the experience that we have already accumulated. The experience of the dissidents' struggle the struggle of the dissidents that showed that there are Russian people who want to have various rights, regardless of what these French communists um, used to say about them, that there are Russian people who love freedom. That was my little political speech about how research is not just about writing books, and that we need to reflect on what is being written as well to understand our present reality better. So my political talk is over. Olga, over to you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Anything else to say or ask? Of course, it was me who cut short this lecture that could have gone on for much longer, but I'm sure that we will come together. The experiment that we've started, the new format that we've started, we've started recording podcasts because it's not possible to discuss all the good books and all the good articles in the format of these kinds of video seminars. We started recording uh, these conversations with authors for our podcast, they will soon be available on our website. And our conversation with Cecile is also going to be available because I am sure that there's a lot more that we can discuss. We've only covered a bit of the 70s, but while we are still here all together, do you have any questions, any um, suggestions or ideas for the, the future podcasts, for instance? Uh, perhaps if you are the author of a book about Soviet dissidents. Cecile, who is the author of the new um, book about Sartre and the USSR? Who wrote it? It is it your book, Cecile? Yes. 
That's why Cecile says, I reread your book about Edinburgh. And do you write to Elena Zorina? Yes, I do. Her daughter lives with us. I met both of them many, many years ago. This was nearly 40 years ago. It's quite interesting to observe this story. So please uh, give my love to Masha, says Joshua. She might remember me because I remember her. I will definitely give you her love, uh, give her your love because she's a wonderful person. She has a great daughter. Thank you. Um, so in the chat, there's a question. What's the exact name of the book in, Fran in French? This book about Sartre in the USSR will be available in about November. And, and the publisher is Bure. Thank you so very much. This conversation was very rich and we will try to continue it. And I would like to come back to this kind of conversation, not only with Cecile, but with others about how in different countries, research connected to Soviet dissidents was shaped. So if you have any ideas about future seminars, I will be very glad to hear from you. Thank you so very much for being with us. I'd like to remind you that on June the 30th is our next seminar. Because um, we have never actually spoken about Jewish dissidents. So uh, please join us. We're going to talk about Claudia Svolo who has already published books in Russian and in German, and now she's publishing a book in English. So thank you so much to the participants, to Cecile. Thank you to all of you, Cecile, and see you again.